final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 11103 in the name of Christina McKelvey on Armed Services Advice Project in a Year of Remembrance. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Christina McKelvey to open the debate around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, and can I say thank you at the very start of this debate to everyone who signed the motion to allow it to be debated on this very, very timely occasion. Um, a little earlier this afternoon, myself and friends from the Armed Services Advice Project, such as Advice Scotland and Poppy Scotland, were delighted to hand to the Veterans Minister a highly significant report. And can I thank them all as they join us today in the public gallery for the work that they do all throughout the year but especially at this time of the year. This report, like Remembrance Day, presiding officer itself, is in a sense a reminder that while we never forget those lost in conflict, we must provide the right support to those who leave the armed forces for civilian life. And a very interesting project that I, I visited this morning in my constituency in Mackinhill Primary School in Lark Hall was the children had identified all 257 men on the remembrance um, stone in Lark Hall and remembered them all today on poppies that they put on the school fence. And it's those examples of our young people remembering the past that allow us to look to the future. And that's what this report's all about. The acronym for this project is ASAP. Seems, and it seems to be to be especially important. In the shifting and changing needs of life under a brutal and bruising austerity regime, we cannot wait around for the hope of something better. We are promised much more of the same, more cuts, ever reducing benefits for those with disabilities, and that group includes many former service personnel. The bedroom tax, debt problems, and just keeping food on the table all become a challenge. Is this fair, equal, appropriate? Is this the kind of Scotland we all want to inhabit? Of course not, not for anyone living in Scotland, whatever their situation and circumstances. But the idea that veterans should be punished for serving their country is especially abhorrent. Back in 2012, Citizens Vice Scotland published Civvy Street, the new front line, which outlined the issues that veterans can experience after leaving the armed forces. And we debated that report in this chamber too. While most people make the transition successfully, a significant minority experience challenging problems. That's where the Armed Services Advice Project features. All sorts of problems can emerge, especially after a long time in service, where you've become unfamiliar with how the civilian world operates. And it changes every day. Sometimes it's difficult for me to keep up with it. But in the armed forces, you can be out of touch with non-serving pals, and that can cause problems as well. Folk aren't always well up in the terms of financial management or running a home from themselves and a family. They may be undiagnosed with mental health problems. They may be accessing payday loans, which are a feature now. And Citizen Advice published a, a report and commented on some of the reaction to payday loans today. And there can be big issues when it comes to family life back on Civvy Street. The adjustment can be very, very difficult indeed. So following on from the original Civvy Street report, this new one, which we've got copies for you. Um, supporting Armed Services Community in 2014 takes a fresh look at the kinds of challenges veterans are experiencing and how most effectively we can help those people to work through them. Veterans are not fundamentally different from people in any other walk of life. They will undergo the same problems as the rest of us. So debt and disability benefit changes will impact upon them in a similar way. In other ways, the patterns are different. Veterans seem more likely to have multiple issues and to sometimes react more negatively to a single problem. The ASAP service makes a valuable contribution in reaching out to the veterans, offering them expert advice and introducing them to the extensive network of support and assistance that is available to them. And that network and support grows every single day through the work of all the projects involved. This distinct roles that the partners involved play, that Citizens Advice Scotland, Poppy Scotland, the RAF Benevolent Fund, Seafarers UK, and SAFA, the Armed Forces Charity, plus the support of Scottish Government, is to be commended and actively supported. The key findings of this report show that housing and benefits have increased in terms of advisory needs, perhaps not something that should surprise us all. The bedroom tax will hit veterans at least as hard as any others. And the cutbacks in DLA often tell in amputees and those with long-term critical health conditions that they are perfectly fit for work will have an extra impact. Advice needs are changing too. The emphasis has shifted. 
that benefit entitlement is the number one issue for ASAP clients tells us a lot about the Westminster Government's attitude, but absolutely nothing about how they plan to tackle it. And perhaps they just don't plan to. And in the report on page seven, there's a table, table one, and there's a top 10 issues for 2012 to 2014. And the top six are benefit entitlement, charitable applications, ESA, DLA for care, housing benefit, and DLA mobility. Now that tells us all a very, very bleak picture. Veterans quite often seek self-employment as an option when they move back to Civvy Street, but a lot of them have a problem with it. The whole business of looking for work, accessing housing, and indeed homelessness are all, need, all, all a need ongoing and careful attention. With, as it says in the report, a 77% increase in support sought with employment support allowance applications, there is a clear correlation to welfare reform and the problems that it presents. The value of sustaining this precisely focused and dedicated project aimed at addressing the needs of veterans is enormous. And I will finish, presiding officer, because I know a number of my colleagues across the chamber have their own experience with ASAP and I'm really keen to hear the, the, the work that they do there and the improvements they've made. But I'll finish with just one comment, and it's on page 25 of the report. And it's a quote from one of the service users. And I quote, ASAP has been absolutely brilliant. All the information they've given me, how they've actually helped me out a lot in the last year, they've got me things that I should have been entitled to for years, but they've got them all in place now. And the key word in there is should have been entitled to. That person should not have needed to seek that type of support for something they're entitled to. It should have been in place. But with the help of ASAP, that is now in place. Practical support, that's what makes a difference. And I commend ASAP to the Chamber and believe that as a government, as a parliament, as ordinary citizens, we must continue to support the work that ASAP Citizens Advice and Poppy Scotland and all the other organisations I've spoke about tonight address. And I wish them well for the next two years and look forward to the next report. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of around four minutes or so. I call Alex Ferguson to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am genuinely delighted to be taking part in this debate this evening and, like others, I congratulate Christina McKelvey on tabling the motion that is before us. As convener of the cross-party group on Armed Forces Veterans and, indeed, as a member of the Advisory Board of Poppy Scotland, the body which funds ASAP, I could not have chosen a more suitable subject for debate on this particular Remembrance Day and I feel very honoured to be taking part in it. The motion makes a really important point which is that most service people make a successful transition back into civilian life. And I think it is some, that is something that we should not forget and should always highlight. Indeed, it is to be fervently hoped that the percentage of those making that successful transition will increase and continue to increase over time. Uh, as the work that is now taking place during service to identify servicemen and women who might require support after leaving the armed forces becomes ever more sophisticated and successful in identifying those most vulnerable individuals. And yet, as the report published by the Citizens Advice Scotland today emphasises, a significant majority experience challenging problems when transitioning from the highly ordered and in many ways protected regime of military life back to the devil take the hindmost and competitive world of Civvy Street. So I suppose it's no wonder that some people find it almost impossible to cope with that change, which, which simply underlines the importance of ASAP's fundamental aim, which is to be a focal point for the armed forces community in Scotland for access to advice, information and support while working closely with key partner organisations to ensure that clients receive the most appropriate support. And, presiding officer, I think that aspect of ASAP's work, liaising closely with the key partner organisations, which Christina McKelvey mentioned, is fundamental to the success that this project has undoubtedly achieved. 
The figures highlighted in today's speech speak for themselves, as Christina McKelvey has noted, and I'm, I'm quite sure that this level of success will continue as a direct result of what the motion rightly calls the tremendous work undertaken by the Armed, Forces, Armed Services Advisory Project. But I would like, presiding officer, to use the rest of the short time available to me to, to highlight one aspect of transition that is perhaps worthy of, of greater focus. I was very moved by a conversation I had with a senior SAFA representative at the reception in Holyrood here to launch the Poppy Appeal just a couple of weeks ago. She told me of a woman who had sought her out for help because this lady was at a complete loss as to how she could continue to look after her ex-services partner without herself finding access to the support that she felt she needed. She was literally, I understand, at her wit's end. And I think this issue was highlighted in a song by Eric Bogle, who is a Scots-born singer-songwriter who has lived in Australia for many years. And he wrote a song called Welcome Home for Australian Vietnam veterans who were returning home at the end of that dreadful conflict. And it, it features somebody called Annie, uh, a long-suffering and faithful wife waiting for her loved one to return. And one verse goes like this. When a nation goes to war, everyone's a casualty. Some are maimed and scarred, but most have wounds you can't, cannot see. So in place of the man she'd known, Annie found instead a sick and troubled stranger in her bed. Uh, I find that verse extraordinarily poignant, presiding officer, but it surely highlights an unsung and heralded partner with whom we need to be working more closely. The long-suffering and patient life partner who too often has to pick up and try to rebuild the pieces of the person that they love uh, who, once they have returned from perhaps a tour of duty or a, a scene of conflict. And they may and probably do get very little thanks for trying to do so. Now, the report does mention the role of carers, and rightly so, presiding officer, but I suspect that there are many ident unidentified individuals out there who struggle to cope with the unexpected personality change in their own partners when they leave the armed forces. They, too, desperately need our help and support, for they are as much victims of conflict as the partners for whom they are caring. ASAP has achieved an enormous amount in its short lifetime, but sadly there remains an enormous amount still to do. This Parliament, I know, wishes it nothing other than continued success, and I feel very privileged to add my name in support of the motion before us this evening. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I sincerely thank and congratulate Christina McKelvey for bringing this motion to Parliament today, uh, probably the most poignant of days in terms of being the 11th day on the, the 11th month. And please forgive me at the beginning of my contribution for taking just a little time to speak about the hellish conflict of WW1. I do for, so for a purpose. Uh, I want to talk about Stirling's role in it. Uh, with its central location, and the railway station, Stirling became an important recruitment centre for Scotland in the First World War, as well as being a base for the Argyll and Southern Highlanders. Stirling acted as a recruitment and transit centre for the thousands of men who were making their way from there to the hell of the trenches. Recruits generally stayed there for a few days, were medically examined, issued their equipment and then shipped off to more permanent bases. And much of the training of the volunteers involved digging and the uh, backfilling of trenches in Kings Park in Stirling and in Plain Country Park. In Stirling, people became used to the sight and particularly the sound of soldiers marching to the playing of pipes from Stirling Castle to the railway station as they left for war. At the beginning of the war, there were hundreds being piped out of the castle, but the, pipe of the, the sound of the pumps, the pipes, gradually disappeared as the war went in, on. And eventually, to the end of that hellish conflict, the city fell silent. There were no pipers left. That's one of the saddest aspects for me of Stirling's military history. And for those who did, not, who did return from war at that time, life would never be the same again. Uh, and of course, there was little or no support available to them when they returned from war outside their immediate families. Today, however, we're very lucky to have projects such as the Armed Services Advice Project, ASAP, who support our servicemen and women returning from conflict zones. 
Having, having such a service with, with specifically provides advice to armed forces community in my constituency is a real benefit not only to the service users but to the community as a whole. And in Stirling, we're lucky enough to have a local advisor called Ali Gemmell, who's there to assist and advise those who have problems which may have been exacerbated by their service experience and any conflict they have been, may have been involved in. Ali and advisors from across Scotland provide special assistance and have links, obviously, into other organisations in their local area to tie in and support those who have the best knowledge and resources. So they're fantastic at pulling people together. My constituents who use this service really value and cherish the support they receive. But in reality, in many ways, ASAP, as Christina McKelvey has outlined, is no different to many other organisations when it comes to the challenges they face. Uh, in fact, a lot of their workload is due to the welfare reforms. And in the past few years, the, the Citizens Advice Bureau has seen an increase in the number of inquiries regarding benefits, with 37% of inquiries from veterans relating to welfare changes. And I think it's quite incredible. We've found now 24 new volunteers operating in the Stirley area is a testament to the scale of the challenge in that regard. But let me bring the support provided by ASAP to life with a story from a former Black Watch soldier from my constituency. This veteran, originally from Canvas Barn, joined the Black Watch at 16, served across the world in many very dangerous war zones. After many years serving his country, he returned home to Scotland to continue with civilian life. Once home, his marriage fell apart, he ended up homeless, and life took downward spiral as he began to take drugs to help cope with the flashbacks he was having from the time in the military. The Armed Services Advice Project was able to step in, offer support, helping him get a war pension and service allowance. If ASAP were not there to help him, I dread to think what might have become of that man and where he would have turned to in his hour of need. Now, there are stories like this from across the country illustrating the dedication and hard work of the support workers from the project and the work that the Citizens Advice Poppy Scotland and our services project are undertaking together in, these, in this area is invaluable cherished and I'm no doubt on occasions life-saving. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you. I now call Mark Griffin to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you, President Officer. I too would like to congratulate Christina McKelvey on securing this member's um, debate um, on Armed Forces Advice Project, particularly on today, Remembrance Day. Um, I would also like to thank Citizens Advice Scotland and Poppy Scotland for the work that they do in delivering the project and for that updated report um, they provided to, to all MSPs today. As the motion points out, the Citizens Advice Scotland project is tremendously important and managed to bring in over £3.8 million pounds, um, going directly back into the pockets of veterans and their families since its inception. That's a return of £3.42 for every pound received in funding for the project, which shows incredible value for money. And while that financial return is certainly impressive, that's not the reason the service is so valued. The reason the service is so valued is the difference it makes to the lives of people who have served the country and are now finding it difficult to adjust to civilian life. And again, like others, I think we should note that while a, a significant minority of armed forces veterans do find it difficult to adjust, that the majority of former serving personnel integrate back into civilian life um, with little or sometimes no difficulty. That said, the, the updated report on the armed forces advice project had some um, certainly interesting findings. The findings around debt were, were particularly positive since it's been recognised for a long time that some veterans haven't always been able to manage their personal finances after leaving the armed forces um, as a result of finding, sustaining employment and housing service leavers can quickly find themselves in debt and financial difficulty. The regimented lifestyle of the forces um, where bills and food um, are not often the responsibility of a, a private soldier um, 
can sometimes lead people into difficulty when they leave the services and aren't quite um, ready um, or prepared or have even spoken about the kind of responsibilities that they'll then have to take on themselves. It, it was surprising and welcome then that the proportion of veterans who were coming to the, the, the project um, with personal debt issues had fallen so much to the point where now there's a lower proportion of former serving personnel coming to the citizens advice with debt issues as, as the proportion of the general population in Scotland. Um, and I, I think that's uh, really commendable and that's obviously down to the hard work that's been going on in, in advising service leavers. That said, the findings on welfare and benefit were anything but welcome. The difficulties veterans have had with the process of claiming benefits and the sanctions that have been imposed are similar to those that we hear about every day in our surgeries from anyone else. But the quote in the report um, from a veteran um, was quite shocking, I found. They said, uh, it wa I wasn't too happy about it because, well, I felt it wasn't my place. Uh, I felt it was my place to work, but because of my injuries, I couldn't. I suppose I was being naive, stubborn. I had pride that I had to go and beg for money from people. Basically, that's the way I looked at it, and I still do look at it that way. That's a comment from a former member of our armed forces, somebody who served our country, someone with an injury, I assume, as a result of active service on our behalf. I don't think any one person is is more deserving than anyone else of a particular um, benefit. But nobody, nobody who's been injured in active service should have any sense that they were begging or undeserving of our support. And I hope that the people who talk about scroungers and talk about benefit fraud is a much bigger issue than it really is. Take some time to reflect on the impact it's had on injured former service personnel. And that, that quote in particular um, really would hit home. The presiding officer, I hope that if anyone is watching the debate and they take anything, it's the support that we in this parliament and that the country will continue to give to our veterans, not because it's out of charity, not because it's out of a sense of pity, not because they've begged for it, but because they deserve it. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And indeed, today is a very appropriate day for us to be holding this debate. For the conflict that started 100 years ago this year came to an end as the guns fell silent at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And in our acts of remembrance around this time, we do tend to focus on the fallen of that and of other conflicts, uh, on those who will never come home. But we do need to remember too those who did come home. And it was to look after the returning veterans maimed and damaged by war that the Earl Hague Fund was set up in the first place, and it is to support veterans that the monies raised by the fund still go. When the First World War came to an end, the returning servicemen were promised a land fit for heroes, but it never materialised. Many of these soldiers struggled to find work or decent homes for their families, and post-traumatic stress disorder was dismissed simply as shell shock. But thankfully, we understand far better the needs of veterans today, but the picture, sadly, is still far from perfect as members have alluded to. Even for those who are not leaving the armed forces after an actual conflict, they can still face real difficulties in making a smooth transition into civilian life. Poppy Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland are therefore to be praised for the work that they have done with the Armed Services Advice Project. And I do welcome the publication of the updated uh, CAS report, which highlights the issues that those leaving the forces face, including, uh, 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 as far as I can see from the report, finding in uh, accommodation, uh, the issue of housing arrears, the issue of homelessness, benefits, which I'll return to in a minute, in a minute and particularly disability benefits and the sanctions imposed, and also employment issues. Uh, the uh, Armed Services Advice Project provides the additional support that many of uh, those men and women need. And uh, we've heard that some 6,000 people have been helped since the project began. 
uh, and on a very practical but purely financial level, the project has been a real success with a total client financial gain of some three point eight uh, million pounds. Um, the return therefore of three pounds forty two for every pound of funding that the project has received is to be welcome but uh, as has been mentioned, that is just one part of the story. And what is much more valuable, I believe, presiding officers, at the pounds than the pounds and the pens is the support that the project provides. The sensitivity and understanding that helps put some very vulnerable clients at their ease and allows them to trust those who are offering assistance. Indeed, uh, one of the clients quoted in the briefing that Cass kindly provided for this debate this evening underlines this. Uh, and I quote, uh, having been very nervous prior to the visit, I was put at ease and dealt with sympathetically. And that sort of understanding and support is a vital component of the way in which the Armed uh, uh, Forces Services Advice Project is reaching out to and supporting its vulnerable clients. Uh, I'm also pleased to note that in the area I, I represent in Mid-Scotland and Fife, uh, CAS has dedicated specialist regional officers associated with this project, not just in, in Stirling, but in Clip Manager, uh, in Fife and in, in Tayside. And it is clear in terms of the detailed breakdown of issues uh, with which people present at a Citizens Advice Bureau that there are some issues that are significantly more common uh, for the ASAP clients than for other clients. And that, of course, reinforces the view that those leaving the armed forces face a very specific and distinct package of difficulties and proves that providing this targeted, specific advice service is not just helpful, but is much needed. And as a member of both the Parliament's Welfare Reform Committee and the Cross-Party Group on Veterans, the work being done by this project is uh, a matter of real uh, interest and pride to me, Presiding Officer. Uh, on the issue of benefits, we have heard that uh, a, a, a particular issue concerns disability living allowance uh, and the sanctions uh, imposed in the system. Uh, and I feel that we really must get to the bottom of that issue. Uh, uh, in drawing my remarks to a close presiding officer, I would wish to say that I'm very pleased to be a supporter of our Scottish Government, which has not only done everything within its power to resist the worst impact of the austerity agenda coming from Westminster, but has also been extremely proactive in working on behalf of veterans. And I pay tribute here in particular to the Veterans Minister, Keith Brown, who, as we know, is himself a, a veteran. Uh, in conclusion, I congratulate my colleague Christina McKelvey in securing this important debate and bringing this issue to the floor of the chamber. And I too join with her in applauding uh, the work of the Armed Services Advice Project. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And finally, in the open debate, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the measures of uh, a responsible civilised society, Presiding Officer, is surely how it treats its veterans, regardless of whether we as individuals agree with the conflicts that our military may have been committed to. We have a duty of care to these men and women when they seek to return to civilian life, especially when involvement in these conflicts may have left its mark physically, mentally or both. Research has shown that in the 16 to 44 age range, the number of ex-service personnel with mental health disorders is three times that of the wider population, a sobering statistic. But even if they haven't been involved in conflicts, we have a responsibility as a society to assist them to make what can for some be a difficult transition into an environment far removed from that which they have been used to. So can I commend the work of the Armed Services Advice Project and my colleague Christina McKelvey for bringing this motion forward for debate. The extent to which this project, funded by Poppy Scotland and delivered by CAB, is needed is identified by today's report with that headline figure showing 5,756 individual clients have been seen in a little over four years since July 2010, generating a financial return for those individuals and their families of approaching £4 million. And when you drill down further, the demand for the services on offer becomes even clearer, because whilst some 1,769 clients were recorded in the first two years of the project, the following two years up to March of this year saw 3,114 people come through the doors, a near 80% increase. Increased. But, presiding officer, we must proactively welcome service personnel and their families back into our communities. Whilst it is great that we have services such as ASAP offer in place, we ought to be making it as easy as possible to integrate for, for service personnel to integrate into civil life in the first place, removing the need to seek out support further down the line when avoidable issues have become problems. And I am proud to represent an area of Scotland which is doing just that. Other parts of the country will, I am sure, be doing their bit as well. But I would like to highlight what veterans returning to or relocating to Angus 
can find by way of immediate, readily accessible assistance. Through Angus Council, services are in place to support veterans in areas such as housing benefit, council tax reduction, discretionary housing payments, Scottish welfare uh, crisis grants, community care grants, should they sa satisfy the criteria. In addition, if a veteran has responsibility for children of school age, free school meals, school clothing grants and educational maintenance allowances may be available. When assessing, uh, assessing entitlement to housing benefit or council tax reduction, uh, it is council policy, when calculated the income of the applicant, to disregard in full any type entitlement to war disablement pension or war widow's pension, thereby increasing the amount uh, that is received. And as part of the Military Covenant, Angus Council provides housing information and advice to veterans and members of the services through their housing options service with advice accessible by a variety of means. There is also a comprehensive information book with Veterans First, which covers a whole range of topics. Perhaps most important of all, though, and as the Minister is well aware, Angus Council is actively providing affordable, accessible homes for ex-service personnel with special needs. This includes individually designed new houses in the Council's mainstream stock, as well as within a new development at Camas Crescent in Carnoustie, where five wheelchair-accessible properties are being constructed for Houses for Heroes. These properties are expected to become available in April or May of next year, and I'm told that in excess of 20 applications have already been received. Richard Callender, the Chairman of Houses for Heroes, has commented on the progress being made there by saying this well-designed development will offer homes tailored to the specific needs of young veterans injured in recent conflicts. The provision of these affordable houses will enable five families to live comfortably in their home communities. And surely that's the key point, in their home communities. As the Minister knows from having formally launched the demolition of the old folks' complex, which used to occupy these, uh, the site, these homes are located in the heart of Carnoustie. And it's sending a clear message that injured ex-service personnel will be welcomed into the heart of our communities, not left on the fringes of them, either geographically or metaphorically. But, of course, no system is perfect. And even in Angus, there will be, indeed, is a need for ASAP. The CAB in Arbroath has been offering a seven hours a week ASAP service for a year now, which has attracted around 50 cases thus far. And that number, I suspect, is set to grow, with discussions underway aimed at establishing an advice clinic at nearby RM Condor. Can I therefore conclude by congratulating Poppy Scotland and the CAB on the work they are doing in this important area and welcome this report published today, which I think provides an informative update on the nature of the issues which prompt ex-service personnel to turn to ASAP for support and advice. Many thanks. Can I now invite Keith Brown to respond to the debate, Minister, in around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I, uh, like other members, congratulate Christina McKelvey on securing this debate and in drawing the Parliament's attention to both the excellent work done by the Armed Services Advice Project, ASAP, and the publication of its annual report providing details of the issues it has assisted veterans with over the last two years. I think, as a number of members have said, this is a very appropriate day in which to do this as we remember those who have served in previous conflicts. I think probably all members will have been involved in remembrance events in their own area, but, uh, and I, like them, did that on Sunday. But two events since then stick in my mind. One was with uh, a local school, Lawrence Hill Academy, who had a fantastic remembrance garden put together by the pupils, a lot of research done, and uh, an absolutely um, spine-tingling rendition of the green fields of France, uh, which was uh, very memorable. And in addition to that, and just thinking about uh, Bruce Crawford's comments about Stirling and how that was central to, as a departure point for many people, uh, this morning I unveiled a plaque at uh, Glasgow Central Station where thousands of people had uh, left to go to the war and, of course, many of them never returned. Uh, members will recall from our 2012 debate on the first ASAP report that the service made an immediate and very effective impact and also that it is highly regarded by the ex-service charity sector, which is very important. The latest report reaffirms the success and importance of ASAP. It continues to offer and provide a comprehensive advice and support service on a diverse range of issues uh, to serving personnel, to veterans and their families. Uh, I should also mention one or two of the comments made by members. I think just hearing the list of things in Angus which are happening through the Council, some of which are happening through the Scottish Government, it really does, I think, hearten me to hear so much is being done for our veterans. That really much, uh, is very much uh, social justice in action for our veterans. I should also say that the figures which you've seen, uh, nearly 6,000 having made use of the service since 2010, is in my view a testament to the staff of ASAP for their incredible work and, fi and a fine reflection of the successes they achieve. But it's also been reported uh, in the media, and I would say that I think that is a real 
uh, testament to success, the fact that so many more people are accessing these services. We, I think in this uh, respect and in many others, are shining a light on the areas where perhaps veterans didn't get the support that they should have had in the past. And I think it's a mark of their success that so many are accessing the services of ASAP. Uh, every bit of help provided, every extra pound of additional benefit, every bit of assistance uh, with finding a job or securing a house, or helping to resolve a financial difficulty makes an enormous and sometimes life-changing difference to the person who's walked through the door of ASAP. And Alec Ferguson quite rightly mentions the fact that the vast majority of service personnel manage that transition very effectively. Uh, but it's also true to say that how more, much more effectively would, the, would some of them manage that if the uh, benefits and the assistance was uh, almost automatic and this was provided uh, as a right and that more was done to create awareness of the benefits which are there. And actually Mark Griffin is right as well. The attitude uh, that some members of the forces have that this is undeserving and it's not really their place to ask for these things I think is something that we have to tackle. Of course uh, they deserve every assistance that we can give them. So the success uh, and support uh, and the determination of ASAP uh, is acknowledged. That's why uh, they're supported by Citizens Advice Scotland, Poppy Scotland, uh, the Army and RAF Benevolent Fund, Seafarers UK, and the Soldiers, Sailors and Airmen Families Federation. So I would, like other members, offer my congratulations to all involved with ASAP on another excellent year. Uh, I know the service works well and it's connected to a range of other support agencies. That's what makes it so effective. Uh, and the report published today proves that to be the case. Uh, the report uh, highlights a number of issues which it's addressed and it makes very interesting reading. In the debate today, members have highlighted both specific examples of achievements and highlighted areas where further work is necessary to ensure that our armed forces community are indeed uh, properly supported by society at large. And just to go back on the point that the previous report, the title of it, that the Civvy Street was effectively the front line, I think does underline the extent, perhaps to the surprise of many people in civilian life, how much of a trauma this can be. And if you think about the increased numbers entering civilian life, some of whom have been made redundant, some of whom have left the service after a long period on active service, uh, which both of which can be quite traumatic, then I think we can see that the, the need for this kind of support will be there for many years to come. Based on the work undertaken on behalf of over 3,000 veterans and covering a two-year period, uh, the report highlights for me uh, that while there are specific issues on which some of our ex-service community can and do need extra support, the arrangement of public services for our armed forces community is improving. Uh, and not surprisingly, their needs also generally mirror those of the wider general population. A number of themes and threads emerge from the report, for example, that debt problems faced by ex-service personnel are dropping, as Mark Griffin mentioned, and are now lower than the general population. And of course, that shouldn't mean that we should be complacent, as debt can be and is a huge burden on individuals and families. But I am reassured to note that credit card debt, for example, is less than half as common as an issue than it was two years ago. And it's also gratifying that while significant to the people who face difficulties or issues requiring resolution, housing, health and employment problems are all relatively low in number. Uh, there's also a strong theme, though, in the report about the difficulties faced by many people, including those who have served, in understanding and accessing the benefits system. Indeed, 40% of all ASAP cases have been in connection with that issue. And, of course, that's a reserve matter. Uh, but I am pleased that organisations like ASAP, with the expertise they have, uh, and the wider ex-service charity sector, are able to assist veterans and families to navigate through the system. It, when last year presiding officer I stood outside the Parliament for a press photo call with service personnel uh, and veterans and representatives of Citizens Advice Scotland and ASAP, we held up placards showing that ASAP had directly helped the Armed Forces community access more than £2 million in benefits from the Department of Work and Pensions that would otherwise go unclaimed. And that was and is an astonishing amount. And behind every pound there, there is a story. It, one year on, that figure, as we've heard, has risen to £3.8 million since ASAP was established. And that is proof, it, if it were needed, that ASAP is a success. But of course, more needs to be done, as many members have said in this area, by the military in preparing service personnel for civilian life before they're discharged. And certainly, I think you could do more work in making people aware of the benefits, not just that are available, but the fact that they are entitled to those benefits as of right.
Uh, we should see more work being done by the DWP in making benefits, the benefit system more transparent by DWT champions in helping ex-service personnel and by the charity sector. And it's also worth noting that the new Scottish Veterans Commissioner, uh, Eric Fraser, uh, Fraser, who I appointed in July and took up his post uh, in August, will also have a crucial role to play. And it's gratifying to see that he's in the gallery uh, today. It will be uh, Eric Fraser's task to gather information on what works for veterans in Scotland and what doesn't. He will identify where improvements in public services have to be made and also establish where there are gaps where disadvantage is still being experienced. And the Commissioner will make recommendations. I will act on those in respect of public services. Where he makes recommendations in respect of other service providers, I will push for change in the appropriate place. And I think there are many members here and other members who are not here who will also play a part in doing that. The Scottish Government has long recognised that the UK Government welfare reforms coming into effect would have a huge impact on our people, our communities and our economy. And we have made our position quite clear. We agree that reform is needed. The system needs to be simpler and the work of ASAP demonstrates that very well. Expenditure needs to be affordable and work needs to pay. However, the UK Government's reforms are absolutely, in my view, not the answer. They are unfair, they are coming too fast, and they are happening against a backdrop of some of the biggest reductions to the welfare system in a generation. We in Scotland see the third sector as a valued and genuine partner in helping us mitigate the effects of decisions taken elsewhere. We are working closely with organisations, including the third sector and local authorities across Scotland, in a collective effort to do all we can to help those affected by the worst impacts of the changes. DLA was mentioned, and there have been thousands upon thousands of pounds lost to many veterans because of that change alone. Advice organisations are playing a key role in providing support to the people bearing the brunt of these cuts. Uh, Presiding officer, the motion today has provided an opportunity to recognise the success of ASAP in delivering real, tangible benefits to those who have served. And I give my assurance that this Scottish Government will continue to work with the armed forces, with veterans charities and public sector providers to ensure we meet the aspirations and expectations of our service personnel, as well as their families. Uh, I think very eloquently described some of the pressures on families by Alec Ferguson and, of course, for veterans themselves. We will not fail in our effort to do the best we can for them. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes Christina McKelvey's debate, Armed Services Advice Project in a Year of Remembrance. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>